Good morning, everybody, all of us, or all of you joining us from the Americas. Uh, this is Marcel Langone, project manager at Solar Plaza. Good afternoon also to all of you that are hearing us uh, from Europe, just like myself. Also, good morning, good afternoon, or in general, good day to all of you that are listening us, uh, are listening uh, the recordings afterwards. Um, today, uh, we will be uh, very in very good company with Michael Bax. He's the CEO of Centauro Energy, which is uh, Macquarie uh, owned by Macquarie. Uh, we'll also have Daniel Espinosa, he's head of asset management for Balan Fund, and we will take you on a journey through the recent dynamics in the Mexican market and also uh, business opportunities related to the corporate PPAs and also. Uh, the merchant uh, solar model. Uh, very welcome to join us in the in the next hour. Uh, again, my name is uh, Marcel Langone. We will be starting uh, the agenda for today with a very brief introduction, and then we will jump into the topics with the help of Michael Bax and Daniel Espinosa uh, on the key challenges and transformations that are occurring as we speak in the Mexican solar markets. Uh, the PPAs and the merchant models and the hidden hurdles in financial model uh, for plants that are already operational in the region. So we'll dive in those uh, very first uh, lessons uh, learned. Uh, after these uh, two uh, presentations, we will then jump into the Q&A. Please, uh, well, we hope that you actively participate with your questions. So I'll explain you how in a minute and we will be ending the webinar in approximately one hour. So stay tuned. For those of you that don't know Solar Plaza that well, we're a B2B high level conference organizer exclusively dedicated to the solar PV industry. And in the last 15 years, we have organized over 125 events. And also we're a content platform for the solar industry. So uh, we bring the latest news to you and also fresh content so make sure to subscribe to our newsletters and read our latest content for for more information and the webinar of today is also a pre-call to our solar asset management mexico and central america uh, next 8 and 9 of october in mexico city it's uh, the conference in the region focus on the operational phase of solar plants and portfolios. We will be dissecting uh, o and topics, asset management topics, and of course, the regulation policy, uh, grids, and other topics that affect the or impact the activity of the asset manager. So we're expecting around 200 attendees and also over 40 uh, leading experts will be on stage with us next 8 and 9 October. And a uh, special uh, attention to our very early bird that expires this Friday, uh, 28th of June. So if you haven't registered in the conference yet, you have the opportunity to not only uh, secure a discounted rate, but also uh, secure your workshop uh, spot. We have uh, six spots, uh, six workshops that you can see on screen with limited capacity. So also, you will uh, enjoy one of these very early first uh, spots for, for the workshop. Before we start with our presentations, I would like to uh, get your attention on a couple of things that will be useful for the next hour. If you have technical issues, use the chat box on, uh, on, on your right on, on the software platform. Uh, use the question box for, for questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to send your questions during the presentations, uh, each of the presentations. We will uh, get those questions, gather them, and conduct the Q&A with our speakers in the end. And the, the slides are already available in the handouts uh, section of, uh, of the software as, as well, so you can follow up all the conversations with the slides in front of you and the recordings will be available afterwards. 
So without further ado, I would like to introduce the, the first speaker of the day. He's Michael Bax. He's CEO of Macquarie owned renewal energy platform called Centauro Energia, active in Mexico. Michael has a broad experience of private equity funding at the CEO, COO, and director level, led, having led multiple transactions in, uh, in this uh, renewal energy uh, scope. And previously, uh, he was the CEO uh, of Termion Energy, which is a development company uh, for renewal energies in Mexico, one of his uh, previous roles. And Michael, uh, we will share you with the keyboard now, and uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. I managed to flip through my first slide by uh, too, too fast, but uh, let's uh, work our way through this. Two seconds, we're going backwards, excuse me. Excuse me, Danielle, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but... There we go. Um, an introduction to the Centauro Energy. Um, as, as we said, um, I'm sorry, my, forgive me everybody, I'm uh, being deeply incompetent. Uh, Centauro Energy is um, owned by Macquarie Infrastructure Partners 4. Um, it's uh, primarily a North American focused unlisted infrastructure fund. It uh, is uh, primarily focused in the, in the USA and Canada, but we represent uh, one of the few uh, investments recently performed uh, by Macquarie, and we anticipate receiving considerably more investment. Um, we currently own here in Mexico, uh, in this uh, asset, 175 megawatts of uh, fixed incline solar uh, in, in, in Durango. Um, we have another 135 megawatt peak under construction, very similar assets. Uh, subject to closing conditions precedent, the assets are being built as we speak and we anticipate having them in operation at the end of the year. Um, those assets are, include a 17 megawatt self-supply and 158 megawatt uh, LEAR project, new market. Uh, all of the assets under construction are, are LEAR. Most of the assets started as being designed under the uh, uh, small producer regime of CFE and have migrated to these other statuses. Uh, we are currently closing right now and anticipate closing in, in a couple of weeks uh, a further 100 megawatts or so of wind and solar, uh, almost all legacy self-supply assets. Uh, so by the end of the year, we should be uh, coming close to 500 megawatts uh, in operation. Uh, we have a very active pipeline in both self-supply uh, and the new market in both solar and wind. Uh, that's probably where we will continue to focus going forward. Um, we have no existing exposure to CFE tender business, as we'll discuss later. Uh, so that was not a matter which uh, uh, has particularly troubled us. Um, our role is to start as a very small central team with uh, externalized operation and maintenance uh, and some externalized asset management services. Uh, but we're growing a team to, uh, over time, assume those responsibilities and build a significant clean energy platform in, in, in Mexico. Um, we are owned by a fund. Uh, we have to behave as if we're owned by a fund, so we're not permanent investors. Uh, we have a defined hold period and a requirement to exit by a defined date. So, uh, however, that date is not that close and we, can, and, and we need to generate income flows. We're not driven entirely by the need uh, to, to, to exit. Uh, but the uh, rate of return is reflected in uh, uh, how we have to buy things. We are we're not a pension fund. We, we run assets for pension funds and we need to make a margin. Um, let's have a little talk about the current business environment. Um, as we said, we're a business to business platform uh, focused on bilateral PPAs. Uh, we don't have any exposure to CFE Sylvester's. Um, 
rates of return on there were simply too low for us. So we haven't been affected by the change in Mexican government policy in this area. Um, Daniel wanted to talk about the role of government a little bit in, in the discussion. And uh, anybody in the electrical business has to deal with government in, in some way. They are all businesses that, that, that work in a political sphere, whether you're in Europe, the USA, or Latin America. All private power businesses uh, in Mexico have got to have significant interaction with, uh, uh, with the Ministry of, of, of Energy, with CREA, the regulator, with SENASE, the system operator, with SEMANAT on the environmental basis, and CFE, which is the owner of uh, <coughs> the, the wires business and is in some and, and generating business and distribution of energy business. Um, as a private player, we have to recognize that policy is the province of government. It's, it's not something we can particularly influence or even try to influence. Um, as businesses, as an international investment business, we can choose to invest in other regions if policy is, is not welcoming. However, once you're already invested, you have to deal with government in one way or another. Um, and uh, what is absolutely clear in, uh, in, in, in Mexico at the moment uh, is that there is uncertainty affecting policy implementation in all of the above institutions. Uh, in every contact that we have with all of them, it is clear that inside the government institutions there is uncertainty as to implementation of active regulations and uncertainty as to the implementation of, of, of new government policy. Um, so one clear effect would be uh, response time uh, in all business decisions. Um, business decisions were not necessarily that rapid beforehand, they're certainly considerably slower now. Um, that uncertainty has also affected clients. Um, our experience in contacting clients, whether in the older market or the new market, is clients are uncertain as to what they want to do. They are nervous about long-term decisions. Uh, they don't really know where their costs are going. Some continue to hope uh, for some form of a subsidy bonanza. <coughs> Others uh, are aware costs are going up, but are hesitant about the, uh, the ongoing uh, policy structure. Uh, we try to advise them that it's very hard to manufacture or, or sell to your clients if your input costs can swing materially. Um, the underlying factor for any electrical system, however, is that clients pay for everything. Um, and in Mexico at the current point in time, uh, they don't feel in control of material, the material facts. Um, grid issues. Uh, this was another issue that we were asked to have a discussion about. Um, grid weakness is a material issue in Mexico. It has been for years. This is not the fault of the new government. Um, it's been the fault of <coughs> a number of previous administrations. Uh, the current administration has cancelled two of the uh, uh, subastas for what was a sort of public-private uh, bid approach and has taken deals back within CFE. However, CFE does not have the financial wherewithal for a material change in transmission, transmission investment. <coughs> so anybody understanding this, uh, anybody looking at the sector has got to understand that uh, grid congestion uh, when, is, 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 is a fact of life. Um, it's not going to go away. And in fact, with new generation, especially with uh, renewable uh, generation placed where the wind blows or whether the sun blows, uh, will make the situation worse. <coughs> Anybody who has experience or, or memory of Chile um, should learn those lessons. Uh, plan for curtailment, plan for that in how assets are contracted, plan for that in the financing structure, and plan for that in the location of the asset and also in the uh, location of their clients. Um, we're already seeing uncertain pricing behavior uh, in the nodes where we generate, both up and down. Um, and we are also experiencing uh, higher lost production hours due to unstable grid conditions than we would anticipate uh, in a more stable system. Um, the reality in Mexico is that the, 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 that the price of grid constraints has effectively been passed to the consumer in the end, uh, who, 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 who pay the cost of congestion in their tariffs. And I, I, I think that's... Uh, understandable but not necessarily uh, incentivizing people to, uh, to adjust uh, and correct the problem.
moving to the next subject, structural challenge. Um, the dispatch process, how you predict transmission flows, what is a must-run plant in the system, uh, working on uh, models of predictable behavior of spot and marginal costs. Uh, Mexico, it is considerably more opaque than in other Latin American markets and certainly in the United States. Um, I'm used to making investment decisions with considerably better information flows than you are available than are available in this market. Um, it is difficult to find out interconnection cues when you're in the development phase. Uh, the capacity of lines to accept new loads are, are managed pretty closely by the, the system operator uh, and they're not freely and publicly available or updated. Um, fundamental elements of, of, of a market, uh, accurate and clear daily prices, how the, uh, the, the, the marginal cost dispatch order is working, uh, what is predictable and real in terms of new load additions, uh, modeling overall system electrical flows, uh, modeling congestion uh, are produced on a, a, a relatively opaque and slower basis than the rest of Latin America and nobody participating in the market should anticipate uh, that this is going to get better quicker. Um, this impacts the, 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 the LIE regulations and new market regulations have been partially completed uh, as, as, as they are and with regard to issues in, including clean energy credits. Uh, they clearly have lenders, lawyers, and clients confused. Um, there is no long-term track. This isn't a market that's been established for years. So the precedent is not very clearly established in new market issues. Um, lenders automatically take recourse to their lawyers. Lawyers automatically then take recourse to the, uh, to the regulator on every issue. So every single step along the way has to be tested by lawyers and regulators. Um, if, law, if, if lenders are hesitant and are unclear as to how the market is working, this will impact uh, everybody in higher fund costs for all participants. Um, what is our focus in the market? Uh, every G20 and, and, and every major Latin country has got a substantial private power market uh, where, where private clients can, can, can buy. Uh, Mexico has or had for a long time a form of uh, private sector participation, but is relatively small as a percentage of the total market. Um, markets where I've, I've played before in Peru and Chile, and you can say so in Colombia as, as well, more than half the energy supply and demand is transacted between private buyers and sellers. Um, and the effect of this competition has driven down costs for businesses and consumers uh, dramatically in the last two decades. Um, we believe if we sit and look at Mexico, its significance as a manufacturing and commercial sector, it's a place where people make a lot of things and has a very successful and robust private sector economy. Uh, we in our business and then our owners are, are very confident in the economy and its future prospects. Uh, there is actual positive demand growth. Um, uh, businesses are actively seeking to drive their costs down because at the current point in time, they're paying uh, a reasonably substantial tariff in all medium tension and high, even in high tension loads. Um, our focus in, in the business is not primarily on high voltage or on low voltage supply, though we can look at both, but principally on the 320,000 middle market clients that have suffered uh, almost all of the changes uh, in tariff prices in recent years. We have interest in both the old self-supply structure in, in assets we already own and in assets we are seeking to acquire and in the new market structure. By the end of the year, as I said, we're going to be about equally exposed to both and capable of acquiring new assets in, in both areas. Um, we look to contract. Uh, we can live with spot exposure. Um, at the current point in time, right now, today, we are pretty closely to 100% exposed to the spot market. Our assets were funded uh, as merchant assets by our, by our lenders. Um, we have contracted and are yet to about to implement as much as 70% of, of, of production in, in our LIE assets. Uh, those contracts are, are inked and drawn and, and in July will take place. But we're capable of maintaining a continued exposure to the spot market. So we're not frightened of the spot market. Actually, the spot market is uh, a, a pretty high uh, price at the moment, 
Um, and if one were totally adventurous, it would be a place that one would want, uh, want a higher exposure. However, our uh, commitment to our lenders uh, is to uh, contract a, a relatively high percentage of our LIA assets, and we have done that. Um, we think uncertainty, which I mentioned before, will drive spot prices higher. <coughs> um, because that's inevitable. If, if, if new generation assets are, are slow to take place, and uh, uh, as, as they may well be, uh, it's likely that spot prices, if supply is growing and uh, if supply is not growing and demand is, <coughs> then the natural effect is that the spot markets will go higher. However, grid congestion in the north could clearly have the opposite effect and has done for some of the early parts of this year. If CFE executes its ambitious plans on a timely basis, spot prices will fall. And our models suggest that uh, that will happen. <coughs> so we have to uh, contract to protect against that. Um, we've achieved long-term contracts to qualified suppliers and LEA assets as long as 20 years. And we've sold ourselves forward in, in a long-term contract with a high-quality off-taker. So uh, we are contracted. Um, overall, we think curtailment is going to have a dramatic effect on project downside, so we do need to be contracted. Uh, I, and, and that has to be included, however, in the structure of the contracts, whether it is through contracting locally or passing on transmission risk uh, contractually, because that part of the market is, is, is poorly developed at the moment. Uh, and the other lesson is lenders can learn how to handle spot exposed projects, and they have done so in Mexico as well and actually did so in, in the case of uh, our assets. And then finally, just a little look at some other issues. Um, market structure and, and uncertainty uh, add to costs. Um, the regulations of the LIA are not complete. Um, that means that there are going to be continued frictions uh, particularly on legal costs. We have not found here that legal costs uh, are any materially cheaper than on a, a, an equivalent US transaction, although rates are lower. Uh, the recurrence, uh, this is not just a rate issue, it's an uncertainty issue. And so there's higher need to have recourse to lawyers. And it's certainly a more expensive place on that basis to do uh, business and equivalent LATAM uh, places where regulations have existed for a considerably longer time and the uncertainty is less in the market. Um, Mexico embarked upon a private market structure looking north uh, as opposed to looking south and created a structure that, that, that's fine uh, in, a, in, in, in an established market but is not fine in a transitional market. Uh, there are multiple intermediary positions uh, that add costs to transactions. Um, as regulations are, have, have not got significant precedence, there is a huge amount of discussion of backwards and forwards through lawyers. Um, I defy anybody to explain to a client the Mexican market uh, in, in, in a five minute discussion. Uh, they historically had one supplier who sent them an invoice and priced it broadly as, as, as they could. Uh, now they have one of the most complicated structures to confront um, and are starting to confront even on uh, a, a purely financial uh, basis as opposed to a physical supply basis. Um, it is understandable why clients are slow to move towards these markets, uh, especially on a long-term basis because the market is hard enough for us to understand who know the business, uh, let alone a client who's not used to uh, contracting his energy privately. Uh, we've also found that, for example, market projections uh, cost two to three times what we have paid in other longer established markets uh, and with lower levels of accuracy or foundation uh, to their arguments. So the market is unnecessarily complicated and this benefits intermediaries and advisors. And, Perfect. Uh, that completes my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the for the very detailed presentation. Uh, and I think that that gives uh, that that gives space for for to to understand how the audience uh, perceives. Uh, well, one of the first things that you, you spoke about was how policy uh, can uh, add to to uncertainty in the market. So perhaps we can look at how 
um, and how the audience experiences. Um, so we're going to have it on screen just in a second. Uh, so as an owner or developer in Mexico, but also if you are uh, a, a service provider, I, I encourage you to, 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 to think about your, your experience, what you have seen in the market. Um, have you faced greater delays with the Mexican government bodies since the change of administrations? Uh, yes, no, or perhaps it's too early to say. And while we show uh, the results, maybe Michael, what would be your expectations on the on the answer? Um, well, my experience uh, leans to say there are greater delays. Those are not necessarily because of issues relating to policy, but primarily relating to uncertainty, changes of individuals in, in the significance. Obviously, the, the CREA has totally changed its government's bodies. Uh, so yes, the answer is there is greater uncertainty and we have experienced delay in every part of our interaction with government. Very good. Let's see the results. Well, at, at least, uh, yeah, there is a big, well, a relatively big majority saying yes. Uh, and some are still uh, expecting how uh, some of the some of the processes un unfold. Yeah, I believe there will be there. There are still quite uh, quite some questions on this. Uh, Michael will get back to you uh after the the second presentation uh in the meantime i would just like to remind everybody that questions are open uh at any time so please feel free to to at any moment of time during the presentations to uh put in your questions we will um hopefully answer uh, most of them um the second speaker for uh, for for our webinar is uh, daniel uh, espinosa uh, he's the head of asset management for Balan Fund, which is a renewable energy investment uh, firm in Mexico. Uh, Daniel uh, personally has over nine years of experience in development, analysis, and financial modeling of energy infrastructure projects. And one of his, uh, or well, his, his back, background experiences on the financial plan is, uh, planning, analysis, and in business uh, development. And with that, uh, Danielle, I would like to give you the, the floor. And uh, yes, we're ready to, to hear you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for being here with us. Um, after such a good uh, presentation by Michael, he has put a high standard, and I hope to, to, to be able to, to live up to that uh, expectation. Um, so, First of all, I would like to make a, first, a quick in introduction of uh, who we are and, and what we do. Um, Balam Fund is a private equity manager created by two other private equity firms. One is BK Partners from Spain and the Rohatten Group uh, based in New York. So we currently manage uh, around uh, $220 million. million dollars. And we're focused exclusively on renewable energy generation assets and, and energy efficiency and sustainability in Mexico. We have a portfolio uh, of renewable energy, which are which is of around uh, 500 megawatts. I'll be talking about it uh, briefly in in a few in a few minutes. No? We are not the typical uh, private equity fund. We invest in, in we, went, we, we, we stay in, in the invested for the long term. Um, so we're not looking for an exit at, at a certain point in time in the short term. Um, our team uh, has plenty of experience uh, in renewable energy. Uh, several of our directors were coming from an, an asset management firm focused in, uh, in, in renewable energy. And uh, so this expertise has, has allowed us to, to design and implement uh, very specific and, and differentiated strategies for each of our clients. Um, so we have uh, a resilient portfolio. Basically, most of our portfolio is invested in uh, full equity, 
uh, all of our solar projects are full equity. Uh, and also uh, our, our management is, is also invested in and has deployed to relevant part of the equity. So we are 100% uh, aligned with our LP's interest. Um, we were selected by Fonadin. Fonadin is the, let's say, the, the, the equity branch of um, Banobras, which is a development bank here in Mexico, uh, to, to manage uh, a, a fund, uh, a green fund, they called it, uh, which is exclusively focused in Mexico. Uh, we're, our investors are mostly pension funds and development banks. Uh, both uh, in national and international. And we manage uh, three different vehicles. One of them is a publicly listed uh, vehicle in, uh, listed in the Mexican Stock Exchange since uh, March 2016. Um, our portfolio is, uh, we have four different uh, operating, uh, four different projects. One of them, uh, well, three are solar and one is a, is a wind project chronologically. And the, for the first one we did is based in, in the state of Chihuahua and the municipality of Camargo, which is a 36 uh, megawatt uh, solar plant. Uh, it was first uh, under the, the, old, uh, the old law, the, uh, under the uh, small producer uh, scheme, and it has now migrated to the new law and is selling the, the, in the wholesale energy market. It was the first uh, fully, full equity, uh, full merchant project here in Mexico. Um, so, so we believe in, in the mer merchant market and we, we feel comfortable with, with the spot prices. Um, and this has been in operation since April 2017. Uh, we also have our second project was in the state of Durango which is uh, uh, similar in size, these are 35.5 megawatts. And this one is in the, under the self-supply regime, which is selling to one of the, the uh, major drugstore companies here in Mexico called Farmacias del Ahorro. Uh, and this one has been in operation since August in 2018. Uh, both of these plants have around uh, 80 gigawatt hours of annual production. Uh, our third, uh, and largest project is a wind farm, which is uh, 396 megawatts, which started operations in December in 2018. And uh, this is the largest uh, wind farm in Latin America. Uh, it's under the self-supply regime, selling to several several companies, including FEMSA, Heineken, and Crown. Um, the, we own 50% of this company, and the other 50% is owned by Mitsubishi. And this. This company, uh, this uh, project uh, has financing also from um, uh, development banks, international and national development banks. Uh, and the last project, uh, which is currently under construction, is also a solar plant of around almost 40 megawatts, uh, which is on, under the self-supply regime. And we're, we're sure this, this is selling to private off-takers and is projected to enter into commercial operation in September of this year. Um, here are some, uh, some pictures of, of our projects. As you can see, um, the, the last one in the, in, the, in the right and bottom corner is still under construction, advancing at a pretty good pace. So we expect no, no surprises in, in operation start. Now, regarding uh, the challenges and the transformations that the market is going here, um, regarding if uh, one of the questions was if this has, has affected our business models, and the truth is, uh, there has been no significant impact for us as of today. Um, we there, there has been. Um, Again, uh, as Michael mentioned, um, a lot of uh, significant uh, changes in the response time by, by the government uh, institutions such as CFD, uh, SENASE, the market operator, and the and CRE, the, the regulator. 
Um, and this, this is, I guess, our, the biggest um, impact on our day-to-day -day, um, operations. Um, but, but we were, were not uh, pursuing any of the tender, the public tenders uh, opportunities. So we were also not affected by, by these cancellations. We believe that these cancellations will or should at least uh, result in, in new opportunities and alternative opportunities as the market needs it. There's, there's a need for new capacity and uh, it's very likely that CFE will not have the, enough financial resources to meet 100% of the electrical uh, needs of the country. So, um, so renewable energy in Mexico and, and particularly solar energy We'll continue to grow. We believe that um, the, the generation targets, the clean energy generation targets will help uh, the country's uh, industry to grow and also the competitiveness of its generation costs. Uh, in other words, uh, this, this is something that can't be stopped in, in our perspective uh, because, because it's, it's too competitive to to put it aside. Um, so so in that sense, we're optimistic about the market. We believe it has it has uh, many challenges and, and has, but it has also many opportunities. So we we feel comfortable and we're we're uh, enthusiastic about going forward uh, with new opportunities. Um, we haven't stopped in, uh, at looking at opportunities and and due diligence. We're uh, in closing phase of new of new projects, so so we're this is uh, still things are still moving for us. Uh, there are, however, uh, as Michael also mentioned, uh, regulatory uncertainties that are hindering, or at least uh, the growth, or at least uh, slowing down the pace of the growth of the industry. One of them is uh, consumer tariffs. Um, Many, many private off-takers are, are hesitant about entering to long-term contract because they believe uh, things might change in the near future uh, and, and they're, not, uh, they're not certain in which direction this change will go. Um, for legacy projects, the willing cost is something that uh, under the, the new uh, program for uh, development of the electrical grid, it was mentioned that this will be revised and that meaning they will probably uh, go up at a certain point in time. Um, we don't know when or how much, but, um, but still we believe that uh, legacy projects are, are interesting despite this uncertainty. So we're still pursuing uh, projects under this scheme. Uh, for bilateral uh, contracts in the, in the new market, in the, in the wholesale market. Um, I guess one of the biggest uncertainties is related to the DFTs, or in, in English, it would be the transmission financial rights. For those who are, who are not familiar with, the, with what this is, this is uh, still one of, the, one of the holes that hasn't been filled in the, in the new regulations. One of the still, the, uh, this regulation is still to, uh, pending to be published. Uh, these are kind of uh, hedges um, for for the differences in prices in, in the nodes uh, between the generation node and the consumption node. This volatility between both nodes and the, and the prices really implies certain risks uh, that somebody has to take, either the, the, the generator or the off-taker. And a, a way to, to hedge these risks will be this, this financial instruments. These were supposed to, to be um, auctioned by, by Senase, but this is one of the things that, that with the new government, it has been delayed. Uh, there hasn't been a uh, um, formal statement uh, from the government as to when this, when this will be uh, carried out, this, this auction. So, um, so there's a still, there's a big if. I, I believe that, uh, that the market will mature by itself and that these, these uh, instruments will also be uh, start to be um, done, carried out by private, private uh, participants. 
So in other words, there will be uh, contracts carried out by, by uh, without the government uh, in order to, to hedge these risks. Um, another uncertainty uh, that, that has many of us wondering what, uh, what will happen is related to the, the clean energy certificates. Um, the tenders were supposed to be, there were supposed to be auctions by, uh, carried out also by the government and is one of the things that has also been delayed. Uh, so this, the prices in this uh, resulting from this, um, this auctions, uh, we believe it's going to be a set, was going to be a set a standard and is going to give um, a lot of more liquidity and a lot of more interest uh, to, to this uh, clean energy certificates, but this was canceled. So really nobody knows uh, yet when this will be carried out, but uh, on the other hand, the, the obligations for participants to buy cer a certain amount of, of clean energy certificate is, has been ratified. So, um, so this is, there's a big bit of mixed messages. Um, on one hand, the, the, the obligations were uh, ratified, and on the other hand, they were, they, they were, the auction was canceled or postponed indefinitely. So uh, uh, there's, there's still this big gap. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, the government has just uh, made an announcement that they want to uh, 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 credit uh, old uh, CFEs, hydros, and nuclear plants with, um, with clean energy certificates. These are large plants, and they, they will, if this does happen, and when this does happen, uh, this will have a significant impact on, on prices since there will be a lot, of, a lot more of uh, supply. Another uncertainty that's been going on uh, is re related to the, to the clearinghouse for, for tenders. As I mentioned, we do not participate. Uh, we have not pursued any opportunities in public tenders, but um, we know this has many players concerned about what's going to happen with this. Related to the, to the grid and how the, how the grid can be an obstacle for, for uh, the renewable energy growth. Um, in our experience, in some cases, it can be uh, an obstacle, um, but in some others, uh, some others not really uh, here, our analysis is really based in, in each node. Each node has its own particularities. Uh, some of them has, still have enough capacity and they have no problems, others, uh, there, there is a big capacity, capacity problem, congestion problems. So our recommendation is that for each node and for each project, a thorough analysis is carried out of, of existing infrastructure as well as projected infrastructure. Um, typically, uh, what CFE wants is to pass pass on. Uh, Pass the, the the upgrade the cost of upgrades for their own infrastructure to the projects. So um, so it's an, it's an important analysis to to see what is the existing infrastructure and what's going to be needed. Sometimes the the requirements that the govern the Senasa, for example, gives out to to projects have certain uh, specification and and the list of equipments. But uh, you really have to dig dig uh, deeper on on what it. Uh, on what's behind. In other words, sometimes this, uh, the equipments that they, they're listed, they require certain other infrastructure that is not um, explicitly listed, but CFE will expect you to, to, um, to deploy that infrastructure. For example, certain protections might need uh, uh, optic fiber for communication and uh, the, the, um, the requirements might need might specify the, the equipment, but might not say that it needs optic fiber, but they will expect you to do both. So, um, so it's a very thorough analysis is recommended for each project. Uh, of a lot of uh, site visits uh, for the advi advisory from technical experts is, is, is very recommended. Um, and the other, the other, thing that needs to be pondered uh, thoroughly is the, the technical and administrative complications or delay that can occur during the interconnection process. Uh, 
in, in our experience, the, the building of the solar plants is the easy part. What it's really complicated is, or can be complicated in some cases, is the interconnection process, both technically and related all, uh, to the, all the administrative work and all the, the permits and, and all the things related to, to uh, the government uh, and government's involvement. Our, our strategy, our investment strategy, is uh, mostly, we look mostly for uh, PPAs, uh, uh, projects with PPAs, with financially solid off-takers. Uh, but you, you always will have certain exposure to market prices, uh, regardless, if, uh, even if you have a, a PPA, um, for, for the excess energy, for example. So, so we look at uh, historically good uh, nodes in terms of prices. We look at, uh, at, at nodes that are close to the consumption areas, uh, nodes that have um, little or problems of congestions, uh, and and we discard many projects that you know would, that don't have historically good good nodes. Also, it was mentioned that one of the the things that could make a project unviable is interconnection. So we, so we look at it very closely beforehand, both in terms of technical aspects as well as economical aspects. Um, we also take into close uh, account and close consideration uh, social and environmental risks. Here in Mexico, for example, there is uh, um, the agrarian law is highly uh, tilted towards to protect uh, is hidos, where they're called, so uh, agrarian communities. Uh, so we we take a close close look at that since uh, there are many risks that can arise from a, a bad handling of social and environmental risks, and uh, and we invest uh, with very low leverage uh, or full equity. Uh, and full equity also allows us to take. Uh, Merchant risk. It also allows us to to move things uh, in a, much faster than to to go into a lender. The opportunities that we're currently uh, pursuing are mostly uh, legacy projects with extended that deadline, uh, meaning the deadline would be the end of next year. There are very few of them left in the market, so we're also looking at merchant projects uh, again in in good notes and to invest with. With equity, um, in terms of corporate, corporate PPAs, uh, in our experience, the appetite for long-term uh, contracts is is decreasing. Um, not so much in the old scheme of the old law uh, and self-supply scheme, um, but mostly in the wholesale energy market. Um, they're looking for uh, co companies are looking for shorter shorter-term um, PPAs. So that makes that the main risk would uh, would then be the the rollover risk of the PPA. Yeah. The as I mentioned, we believe the the wholesale energy market still needs to be further developed. Uh, for example, these hedges, uh, the the financial distribution rights, uh, whether it be uh, provided or created by the government or privately, um, and also what what we're doing, what we're looking for is to to look for, for uh, projects that are near the consumption risk, uh, zones in order to reduce, reduce the risk in, in differences in node prices. In terms of, of uh, merchant projects, as I, as I mentioned, the whole difference is, is the node. So, and there are uh, very, very big differences uh, from one node to another, depending on the, on the ge geographical location of the project. Um, a good, a good thing has been that, as, as also Michael also mentioned, is that merchant risk has been validated, has been uh, taken on by, by banks here in Mexico. Um, they, I think, uh, because of how the, the market has been developing in Mexico and the attractiveness of it, uh, many banks have been looking at, uh, a lot closer to this and, and don't want to, they don't want to miss out on, on, on these opportunities. And so, of, um, there, there is a possibility now to, to finance projects uh, that, are, that are fully merchant risk or part, uh, partial mer merchant risk. Of course, 
with a greater amount of equity and lower leverage. Um, very high, highly levered uh, projects uh, in the merchant market also imply a high risk of, of default. Um, and what we highly recommend is uh, that you that you get price curves by expert firms. These, are, of course, uh, they will they will, ha they will have significant differences from uh, the projections from the real life, but they'll give you a sense of of what um, the of what uh, ballpark you're talking about. So what um, the ranges in price they will take into consideration. Uh, the 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 planning of of new uh, generation assets in the zone. So they'll take a, into account many things that uh, that is hard to take into consideration otherwise. Um, so we uh, we have found that most the most uh, disparities between financial models and and the real output uh, comes of course from from production. Um, Mainly, in our experience, from from uh, the projections in tracker gains, um, uh, there the in, in particular here in Mexico, there has been there is no uh, uh, historical figures for diffuse radiation, so um, this makes it uh, th this creates a disparity between projection and um, and real output temperature is also one of the things that we found certain disparities. Um, the other one, the other big one is merchant prices. There, uh, there's a lot of volatility and there's, um, again, it's, uh, you, you can have projections made by experts, but uh, it's hard to, to, to have a, a projection that, that is, you know, consistent, consistently uh, hitting or a certain range close to what, what you projected. Uh, interconnection calendar and costs is the other thing um, because it depends on on CFD and Senase. Sometimes they'll uh, you know they'll take uh, way too much time that and then you anticipated to 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 respond uh, requests or or whatever. Uh, and also they they might uh, add certain certain equipment that, were, that you didn't consider it, uh, beforehand. And this is hard to argue um, that you can go through uh, legal pro procedures to 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 you know to, to get rid of those costs, but this also implies time. So you have to ponder what what's best for you to either you know get, get into a legal fight with them over whatever they're requesting, or simply comply and and meet your deadlines or meet your calendars. The other the other part that also imply involves CFE, uh, which uh, which is out of our, your control and that can also lead to, to higher um, or longer times in your calendar is the implementation of load points uh, meter infrastructure. So the meters have to be in, uh, in the load points for self-supply contracts have to be installed by CFE. Yeah, you can do by yourself certain uh, adequations, but um, the, the installation of the, of the meter has to be by law by uh, CFE. So, um, so you really can't control that, and this can lead to, to certain uh, delays. Um, so basically, this is you know the, the topics that, that we were asked to, to talk about. Um, I hope that this was interesting, and I'll give the, the, the microphone back to Marcel, and, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for the presentation. Uh, please uh, hold on on the line. We're just... Uh, getting uh, to the Q&A phase. Uh, we have quite a lot of, uh, of questions. Uh, please uh, st still do put your questions because if we're not able to answer them now, we'll, we'll follow up on that. Um, and perhaps since we have quite some, uh, uh, some asset managers, as, uh, just as you, Danielle, you were just mentioning about the well, the, the production, uh, the disparity of, of the production. So you mentioned that once is related to, uh, one is related to the, uh, to the lack of uh, historical uh, data uh, for the diffuse radiation is based on your experience. And you mentioned that a couple of your plants are already operational for years. Are there any uh, s specific uh, system under performance that you see uh, apart from 
uh, these uh, disparities on uh, on on uh, irradiation? Um, no, not really. Um, we we let's say we we in the beginning of our of our uh, the operations we made some certain adjustments. Uh, we had the 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 equipment supplier made certain adjustments to inverters to to adjust better to to voltage uh, in the grid line here in Mexico. But but basically our our disparities come from um, from from these projections. From uh, um, we we also installed. Uh, um, to, to, um, I don't know the word in English, the, we installed uh, equipment to measure diffuse radiation in, in each of our plants in order to uh, in the, start getting this, these measurements and in the future, as needed, uh, adjust our projections with our, um, in, order, in order for them to be closer to, to the real uh, expectation. Um, but, but basically that's it. Uh, th thanks, Daniel. And um, uh, one question more more related to the well to the market products in this case maybe uh, this uh, this one for for Michael. So as as an investor, how much value are you putting on uh, on the green uh, certificates, short term and long term, when you're looking to acquire new projects in uh, in the market? Um, the answer would be that that uh, a diminishing uh, reliance. Um, at the same time, this is one of those market uncertainties that I talked about. I think it would be a brave man to uh, uh, to say they were going to go up, but at the same time, uh, it's hard to say how much they will go down. They've gone down in almost every other market uh, in, in, in Latin America, so we have to take a very conservative position when it comes to including them in our projections. Uh, we were able to sell uh, broadly, all of our clean energy certificates uh, uh, some time ago on the existing portfolio. So that element is uh, is resolved for quite some time. But as for future ones, uh, I wouldn't be very bullish on the pricing. Uh, but if you ask me why, I would say <laughs> that's what happens everywhere, as opposed to any specific reason here. Thanks, Michael. And um, and another point that was uh, that is crucial and 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 was mentioned by both of you, the the congestion. Uh, so there, there is a comment from one of our participants that the, the prices at, at the northern nodes are being reduced rather than increased. Um, maybe we can start with you, Daniel. Would you expect that more transmission capacity could impact positively the, the marginal prices? Yes, um, I think that, that uh, Less congestion, of course, would lead to to higher prices. Um, what I'm not uh, so so certain or so optimistic about is that this will this new capacity, uh, this new transmission capacity, will be implemented uh, soon, anytime soon, given um, well, given the priorities of of our new government. Um, but definitely, yeah, um, uh, we've seen that prices. Have gone down. We have uh, two projects in in the the, the northern uh, states, and and we've seen it uh, significantly, at least from last year to, to this year, they have they have uh, they have been going down. Well, they're still, I guess, uh, relatively good prices in the notes that we're connected to, but but um, but that we don't think that this is um, that, that they will keep on being very good prices. Uh, they'll, probably, they'll tend to go down as, as congestion increases. Mm -hmm. There are quite some questions as well on uh, on coupling solar with energy storage. Maybe I can get one one of those. Um, uh, so, Michael, is is uh, energy storage already playing an effective role in uh, in the solar market in uh, in Mexico? Do you think this is uh, as adds uh, to a solution for bankable projects? Um, we've looked at it on a number of occasions in, in both here and in prior uh, lives and, and have found it hard to uh, uh, make projects pencil. Um, I suspect they could do in certain in, inside the fence transactions, but in a system that doesn't really pay for some of the things that storage brings you, um, you know, 
frequency regulation and other issues, uh, those services are not fully fully priced out as they might be in, for example, the Californian market where, um, where, where peaking plants are rapidly being replaced by, by batteries. So I would say for the moment, until regulations get better and we have a more clear and consistent market story, uh, batteries will be something for the future. Uh, though obviously the continued reduction in cost keeps them uh, keeps them in, in, in debate. Yeah, in in terms of those uh, those those uncertainties, still still with you, and then I would like to to ask the same question to to Daniel. Um, in terms of these uh, these uncertainties, what do you think uh, would be priority number one for regulators in Mexico? Uh, priority number one relating to projects is don't pay very much for them um, and make sure they're as highly efficient as they can. So you have to get the fundamentals of the project uh, right um, and you certainly should not be uh, be overpaying. It's not a time for paying uh, premium, uh, which would seem to me to point towards uh, a more focused approach to development, um, preparing not just for now but for the future. Um, uh, it's not a time when there is uncertainty. It's not a time to be to, to be particularly clever um, or particularly ambitious. I, I think it's a, a time for returning to basics. The market is still good, uh, but projects should be structured on as simple and uh, a basis as as is humanly possible. Perfect. So, um, uh, Daniel, what is your your take on this? It's very similar to Michael's. Um, we believe that once the the, the, the um, what this projects bring to the table is is paid, uh, such as for example, as, uh, Michael mentioned uh, frequency regulation and other things. Once uh, once this is uh, rewarded by the market, then I think it it will be a lot more interesting. Uh, and there will be many opportunities. Um, there is no clear regulation yet uh, related to energy storage. So it, it'll be um, very speculative to to invest in, uh, in, uh, in our opinion today, in uh, an energy storage project. Maybe um, some behind the meter uh, projects, smaller projects for certain uh, companies that, that we see that um, that could work, but but not really like utility scale um, projects nowadays. Um, in theory, uh, the CRE, the, the regulator here in Mexico, is working in some, some new regulation that is supposed to come out uh, in the near future, but in practice, really, I would say nobody really knows when this will come out. So until the, the rules for this are, are laid out and clear for everybody, um, I agree with Michael that best is to, to stick to the basics and and maybe not try to be too clever on this. Uh, thanks both for the for the last comments. Uh, we're a little over time, so we need to to round up the our our question uh, session. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael and Daniel, for for your participation. Thanks as well to to all uh, our audience for uh, for your active participation in the polls, uh, in the questions. I just would like to remind you that. Uh, our very early bird expires this Friday, the 28th of June. So apart from getting a discounted rate, you can also secure your workshops, uh, workshop spot um, with limited capacity. And one of the topics we will be uh, discussing together with, uh, with the financier, with the sponsors, one of those uh, workshop topics will be financing uh, Merchant Solar uh, going uh, forward. So. Uh, if you haven't registered yet, take take that chance before uh, Friday. And um, regarding our upcoming uh, projects, uh, events, naturally will be in October 8 and 9 in uh, Mexico uh, City, uh, but we will also be with the solar asset management uh, agenda later in uh, October uh, in Frankfurt and in uh, Dubai in uh, November. But for other uh, LATAM events, I would still like to mention the Solar Future uh, Colombia that will also happen in November. So I hope uh, to see you 
uh, well, hopefully earlier in, uh, in Mexico City in October or at one of these events. And would like to still wish you a very good day if you are in the Americas or a very good end of afternoon for everybody joining us from Europe. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time.